Chapter Fifteen of Robin Hood by J. Walker McSpaden. How Robin Hood was tanned of the tanner. In Nottingham there lived a jolly tanner with a hey down down a down down. His name was Arthur Bland. There never was a squire in Nottinghamshire dare bid bold Arthur stand. And as he went forth in a summer's morning with a hey down down a down down to the forest of Mary Sherwood to view the red deer that range here and there there he met with bold robin hood the sheriff's daughter bided for several days in the faint hope that she might hear tidings of the prattling tinker but never a word heard she and she was forced to the conclusion that her messenger had not so much as laid eyes upon the outlaw little recked she that he was even then grinding sword points and sharpening arrows out in the good greenwood while whistling blithely or chatting merrily with the good friar tuck then she bethought herself of another good man one arthur a bland a tanner who dwelt in nottingham town and was far famed in the tourneys round about he had done some pretty tricks at archery but was strongest at wrestling and the quarter-staff for three years he had cast all comers to the earth in wrestling until the famous eric a lincoln broke a rib for him in a mighty tussle Howsoever, at quarterstaff he had never yet met his match, so that there was never a squire in Nottinghamshire, dare bid bold Arthur stand. With a long pike staff on his shoulder, so well he could clear his way, that by two or three he made men flee, and none of them could stay. Thus at least runs the old song which tells of his might. This is just the man for me, thought the sheriff's daughter to herself and she forthwith summoned him to the mansion-house and commissioned him to seek out robin hood the warrant was quite to arthur's liking for he was happiest when he was out in the forest taking a sly peep at the king's deer and now he reckoned that he could look at them boldly instead of by the rays of the moon he could say to any king's forester who made bold to stop him i am here on the king's business gray mercy no more oak bark and ditch water and the smell of half tine hides to-day quoth he gaily i shall e'en see what the free air of heaven tastes like when it sweeps through the open wood so the tanner departed joyfully upon his errand but much more interested in the dun deer of the forest than in any two-legged rovers therein this interest had in fact caused the foresters to keep a shrewd eye upon him in the past for his tannery was apt to have plenty of meat in it that was more like venison than the law allowed as for the outlaws, Arthur bore them no ill will. Indeed, he had felt a secret envy in his heart of their free life. But he was not afraid to meet any two men who might come against him. Natheless, the sheriff's daughter did not choose a very good messenger, as you shall presently see. Away sped the tanner, a piece of bread and some wine in his wallet, a good longbow and arrows slung across his shoulder, his stout quarterstaff in his hand, and on his head a cap of troubled rawhide so tough that it would turn the edge of a broadsword he lost no time in getting out of the hot sun and into the welcome shade of the forest where he stalked cautiously about seeking some sign of the dun deer now it so chanced that upon that very morning robin hood had sent little john to a neighboring village to buy some cloth of lincoln green for new suits for all the band some of the money recently won of the king was being spent in this fashion against the approach of winter will scarlet had been sent on a similar errand to barnsdale some time before if you remember only to be chased up the hill without his purchase so to-day little john was chosen and for sweet company's sake robin went with him a part of the way until they came to the seven does the inn where robin had recently played his prank upon middle the tinker here they drank a glass of ale to refresh themselves withal and for good luck and robin tarried a bit while little john went on his errand presently robin entered the edge of the wood when whom should he see but arthur a bland busily creeping after a graceful deer that browsed alone down the glade now by saint george and the dragon quoth robin to himself i much fear that yon same fellow is a rascally poacher come after our own and the king's meat for you must know by a curious process of reasoning robin and his men had hunted in the royal preserve so long that they had come to consider themselves joint owners to every animal which roamed therein nay he added this must be looked into 
That cowskin cap in sooth must hide a scurvy varlet. And forthwith he crept behind a tree, and thence to another, stalking our friend Arthur as busily as Arthur was stalking the deer. This went on for quite a space, until the tanner began to come upon the deer and draw his bow in order to tickle the victim's ribs with a cloth-yard shaft. But just at this moment Robin unluckily trod upon a twig which snapped and caused the tanner to turn suddenly. Robin saw that he was discovered, so he determined to put a bold face on the matter and went forward with some smart show of authority. Hold! he cried. Stay your hand. Why, who are you, bold fellow, to reign so boldly here? In sooth, to be brief, ye look like a thief that has come to steal the king's deer. Mary, it is scant concern of yours what I look like, retorted Arthur of Bland. Who are you who speak so bravely? You shall soon find out who I am, quoth Robin, determining to find some sport in the matter. I am a keeper of this forest. The king knows that I am looking after his deer for him, and therefore we must stay you. Have you any assistance, friend? asked the tanner calmly, for it is not one man alone who can stop me. Nay, truly, gossip, replied Robin, I have a good yew bow, also a right sharp blade at my side. Nay, less, I need no better assistant than a good oak graft like unto yours. Give me a baker's dozen of minutes with it, and it shall pleasure me to crack that pate of yours for your sauciness. Softly, my man, fair and softly. Big words never killed so much as a mouse. Least of all yon deer which has got away while you were filling all the woods with your noisy breath. So choose your own playthings. For your sword and your bow I care not a straw, nor for all your arrows to boot. If I get but a knock at you, twill be as much as you'll need. Now, by our lady, will you listen to the braggart? cried Robin in a fine rage. Marry, but I'll teach ye to be more mannerly. So saying, he unbuckled his belt, and flinging his bow upon the ground, he seized hold of a young sapling that was growing nearby. His hunting knife soon had it severed and lopped into shape. Now, come, fellow, said Arthur of Bland, seeing that he was ready, and if I do not tan your hide for you in better shape than ever calfskin was turned into top boots, may a moraine seize me. Stay, said Robin, methinks my cudgel is half a foot longer than yours. I would have them of equal length before you begin your tanning. I pass not for length, bold Arthur replied. My staff is long enough, as you will shortly find out. Eight foot and a half, and twill knock down a calf. Here he made it whistle in the air and I hope it will knock down you. Forthwith the two men spat on their hands, laid firm hold upon their cudgels, and began slowly circling round each other, looking for an opening. Now it so chanced that Little John had fared expeditiously with his errand. He had met the merchant, from whom he was wont to buy Lincoln Green, coming along the road, and had made known his wants in few words. The merchant readily undertook to deliver the suits by a certain day in the following month. So Little John, glad to get back to the cool shelter of the greenwood, hasted along the road lately taken by Robin. Presently he heard the sound of angry voices, one of which he recognized as his captain's. Now, heaven forfend, quoth he, that Robin has fallen into the clutches of a king's man. I must take a peep at this fray. So he cautiously made his way from tree to tree, as Robin had done, till he came to the little open space where Robin and Arthur were circling each other with angry looks, like two dogs at bay. Ha! This looks interesting, muttered Little John to himself, for he loved a good quarter-staff bout above anything else in the world, and was the best man at it in all the greenwood, and he crawled quietly underneath a friendly bush, much as he had done when Robin undertook to teach Will Scarlet a lesson, and chuckled softly to himself, and slapped his thigh, and prepared to watch the fight at his ease. Indeed, it was both exciting and laughable. You would have chuckled one moment, and caught your breath the next, to see those two stout fellows swinging their sticks, each half as long again as the men were, and thick as their arm, and edging along sideways, neither wishing to strike the first blow. At last Robin could no longer forbear, and his good right arm swung round like a flash. Ping! went the stick on the back of the other's head, raising such a welt that the blood came. But the tanner did not seem to mind it at all, for Bing went off his own staff in return, giving Robin as good as he had sent. Then the little battle was on, and furiously it waged. Fast fell the blows, 
but few save the first ones landed being met in mid-air by a counter-blow till the thwacking sticks sounded like the steady roll of a kettle-drum and the oak bark flew as fine as it had ever done in arthur a bland's tannery round and round they fought digging their heels into the ground to keep from slipping so that you would have vowed there had been a yoke of oxen ploughing a potato patch round and round up and down in and out their arms working like threshing machines went the yeoman and the tanner for a full hour each becoming more astonished every minute that the other was such a good fellow while little john from underneath his bushy covert had much ado to keep from roaring aloud in pure joy finally robin saw his chance and brought a full arm blow straight down upon the other's head with a force that would have felled a bullock but arthur's troubled cowskin cap here stood him in good stead the blow glanced off without doing much more than stunning him Natheless, he reeled and had much ado to keep from falling seeing which robin stayed his hand to his own sorrow for the tanner recovered his wits in a marvellous quick space and sent back a sidelong blow which fairly lifted robin off his feet and sent him tumbling on to the grass hold your hand hold your hand roared robin with what little breath he had left hold i say and i will give you the freedom of the greenwood well god a mercy said arthur i may thank my staff for that not you well gossip let it be as it may but prithee tell me your name and trade i like to know fellows who can hit a blow like that same last i am a tanner replied arthur a bland in nottingham long have i wrought and if you'll come to me i swear i'll tan your hides for naught odds bodkins quoth robin ruefully mine own hide is tan enough for the present howsoever there be others in this wood i would fain see you tackle Harkee, if you will leave your tan pots and come with me as sure as my name is robin hood ye shan't want gold or fee by the breath of my body said arthur that will i do and he gripped him gladly by the hand but i am minded that i clean forgot the errand that brought me to sherwood i was commissioned by some under the sheriff's roof to capture you so was a certain tinker now in our service said robin smilingly verily tis a new way to recruit forces said the tanner laughing loudly but tell me good robin hood where is little john i fain would see him for he is a kinsman on my mother's side here i am good arthur a bland said a voice and little john literally rolled out from under the bush to the sward his eyes were full of tears from much laughter which had well nigh left him powerless to get on his feet as soon as the astonished tanner saw who it was he gave little john a mighty hug around the neck and lifted him up on his feet and the two pounded each other on the back soundly so glad were they to meet again oh man man said little john as soon as he had got his breath never saw i so fine a sight in all my born days you did knock him over like as he were a ninepin and you do joy to see me thwacked about on the ribs asked robin with some choler nay not that master said little john but tis the second time i have had special tickets to a show from beneath the bushes and i cannot forbear my delight howsoever take no shame unto yourself for this same arthur a bland is the best man at the quarterstaff in all nottinghamshire it commonly takes two or three men to hold him unless it be eric o'lincoln said arthur modestly and i well know how you paid him out at the fair say no more said robin springing to his feet for well i know that i have done good business this day and a few bruises are easy payment for the stout cudgel i am getting into the band your hand again good arthur a bland come let us after the deer of which i spoiled your stocking righty gladly quoth arthur come cousin little john away with vats and tan bark and vile smelling cowhides i'll follow you two in the sweet open air to the very ends of earth so ends chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of robin hood how robin hood met sir richard of the lea then answered him the gentle knight with words both fair and thee god save thee my good robin and all thy company now you must know that some months passed by the winter dragged its weary length through sherwood forest and robin hood and his merry men found what cheer they could in the big crackling fires before their woodland cave friar tuck had built him a little hermitage not far away where he lived comfortably with his numerous dogs the winter i say reached an end at last 
and the blessed spring came and went. Another summer passed on apace, and still neither king nor sheriff nor bishop could catch the outlaws, who, meanwhile, thrived and prospered mightily in their outlawry. The band had been increased from time to time by picked men such as Arthur of Bland and David of Doncaster, he who was the jolliest cobbler for miles around, until it now numbered a full seven score of men, seven companies each with its stout lieutenant serving under Robin Hood, and still they relieved the purses of the rich, and aided the poor, and feasted upon King's deer, until the lank sheriff of Nottingham was well nigh distracted. Indeed, that official would probably have lost his office entirely, had it not been for the fact of the king's death. Henry passed away, as all kings will, in common with ordinary men, and Richard of the Lionheart was proclaimed as his successor. Then Robin and his men, after earnest debate, resolved to throw themselves upon the mercy of the new king, swear allegiance, and ask to be organized into royal foresters. So Will Scarlet and Will Stutley and Little John were sent to London with this message, which they were first to entrust privately to Maid Marian. But they soon returned with bad tidings. The new king had formally set forth upon a crusade to the Holy Land, and Prince John, his brother, was impossible to deal with, being crafty, cruel, and treacherous. He was laying his hands upon all the property which could easily be seized, among other estates, that of the Earl of Huntington, Robin's old enemy and Marion's father, who had lately died. Marion herself was in sore straits. Not only had her estates been taken away, and the maid been deprived of the former protection of the queen, but the evil Prince John had persecuted her with his attentions. He thought that since the maid was defenceless, he could carry her away to one of his castles, and none would gainsay him. No word of this peril reached Robin's ears, although his men brought him word of the seizure of the Huntingdon lands. Natheless, he was greatly alarmed for the safety of Maid Marian, and his heart cried out for her strongly. She had been continually in his thoughts, ever since the memorable shooting at London Town. One morning in early autumn, when the leaves were beginning to turn gold at the edges, the chestnut pods to swell with promise of fatness, and the whole wide woodland was redolent with the ripe fragrance of fruit and flower, Robin was walking along the edge of a small open glade, busy with his thoughts. The peace of the woods was upon him, despite his broodings of Marion, and he paid little heed to a group of does quietly feeding among the trees at the far edge of the glade. But presently this sylvan picture was rudely disturbed for him. A stag, wild and furious, dashed suddenly forth from among the trees, scattering the does in swift alarm. The vicious beast eyed the green and gold tunic of Robin, and lowering its head, charged at him impetuously. So sudden was its attack that Robin had no time to bend his bow. He sprang behind a tree while he seized his weapon. A moment later the wild stag crashed blindly into the tree trunk with a shock which sent the beast reeling backward, while the dislodging leaves from the shivering tree fell in a small shower over Robin's head. "'By my halidom, I am glad it was not me you struck, my gentle friend,' quoth Robin, fixing an arrow upon the string. "'Sorry, indeed, would be any one's plight who should encounter you in this black humour.' Scarcely had he spoken when he saw the stag veer about and fix its glances rigidly on the bushes to the left side of the glade. These were parted by a delicate hand, and through the opening appeared the slight figure of a page. It was Maid Marian, come back again to the greenwood. She advanced, unconscious alike of Robin's horrified gaze and the evil fury of the stag. She was directly in line with the animal, so Robin dared not launch an arrow. Her own bow was slung across her shoulder, and her small sword would be useless against the beast's charge. But now as she caught sight of the stag she pursed her lips as though she would whistle to it. "'For the love of God, dear lady!' cried Robin, and then the words died in his throat. With a savage snort of rage the beast rushed at this new and inviting target, rushed so swiftly and from so short a distance that she could not defend herself. She sprang to one side as it charged down upon her but a side blow from its antlers stretched her upon the ground. The stag stopped, turned, and lowered its head, preparing to gore her to death. Already its cruel horns were coming straight for her, while she, white of face and bewildered by the sudden attack, was struggling to rise and draw her sword. 
a moment more and the end would come but the sharp voice of robin had already spoken down marion he cried and the girl instinctively obeyed just as the shaft from robin's bow went whizzing close above her head and struck with terrific force full in the centre of the stag's forehead the beast stumbled in its charge and fell dead across the body of the fainting maid robin was quickly by her side and dragged the beast from off the girl picking her up in his strong arms he bore her swiftly to the side of one of the many brooks which watered the vale he dashed cool water upon her face roughly almost in his agony of fear that she was already dead and he could have shed tears of joy to see those poor closed eyelids tremble he redoubled his efforts and presently she gave a little gasp where where am i what is it you are in sherwood dear maid though i faith we gave you a rude reception she opened her eyes and sat up methinks you have rescued me from sudden danger sir she said then she recognized robin for the first time and a radiant smile came over her face together with the rare blush of returned vitality and her head sank upon his shoulder with a little tremble and sigh of relief oh robin it is you she murmured ay tis i thank heaven i was at hand to do you service robin's tones were deep and full of feeling i swear dear marion that i will not let you from my care henceforth not another word was spoken for some moments while her head still rested confidingly upon his breast then recollecting he suddenly cried gray mercy but i make a poor nurse i have not even asked if any of your bones were broken no not any she answered springing lightly to her feet to show him that foolish dizziness o'ercame me for the nonce but we can now proceed on our way nay i meant not that he protested why should we haste first tell me of the news in london town and of yourself so she told him how that the prince had seized upon her father's lands and had promised to restore them to her if she would listen to his suit and how that she knew he meant her no good for he was even then suing for a princess's hand that is all robin she ended simply and that is why i donned again my page's costume and came to you in the greenwood robin's brow had grown fiercely black at the recital of her wrong and he had lain stern hand upon the hilt of his sword by this sword which queen eleanor gave me he said impetuously and which was devoted to the service of all womankind i take oath that prince john and all his army shall not harm you so that is how maid marian came to take up her abode in the greenwood where the whole band of yeomen welcomed her gladly and swore fealty and where the sweet lady of allen a dale made her fully at home but this was a day of deeds in sherwood forest and we again to tell you another happening which led to later events while robin and marian were having their encounter with the stag little john much the miller's son and will scarlet had sallied forth to watch the high road leading to barnsdale if perchance they might find some haughty knight or fat priest whose wallet needed lightening they had scarcely watched the great road known as watling street which runs from dover in kent to chestertown for many minutes when they espied a knight riding by in a very forlorn and careless manner all dreary was his semblance and little was his pride his one foot in the stirrup stood, his other waved beside. His visor hung down o'er his eyes, he rode in single array. A sorrier man than he was one, rode never in summer's day. Little John came up to the knight and bade him stay, for who can judge of a man's wealth by his looks? The outlaw bent his knee in all courtesy, and prayed him to accept the hospitality of the forest. My master expects you to dine with him to-day, quoth he and indeed has been fasting while awaiting your coming these three hours who is your master asked the knight none other than robin hood replied little john laying his hand upon the knight's bridle seeing the other two outlaws approaching the knight shrugged his shoulders and replied indifferently tis clear that your invitation is too urgent to admit of refusal quoth he and i go with you right willingly my friends my purpose was to have dined to-day at Blythe or Doncaster, but nothing matters greatly. So in the same lackadaisical fashion which had marked all his actions that day, the knight suffered his horse to be led to the rendezvous of the band in the greenwood. Marian had not yet had time to change her page's attire when the three escorts of the knight hove in sight. 
she recognized their captive as sir richard of the lea whom she had often seen at court and fearing lest he might recognize her she would have fled but robin asked her with a twinkle if she would not like to play page that day and she in roguish mood consented to do so welcome sir knight said robin courteously you are come in good time for we were just preparing to sit down to meet god save and thank you good master robin returned the knight and all your company it likes me well to break the fast with you so while his horse was cared for the knight laid aside his own heavy gear and laved his face and hands and sat down with robin and all his men to a most plentiful repast of venison swans pheasants various small birds cake and ale and marion stood behind robin and filled his cup and that of the guest after eating right heartily of the good cheer the knight brightened up greatly and vowed that he had not enjoyed so good a dinner for nigh three weeks he also said that if ever robin and his fellows should come to his domains he would strive to set them down to as good a dinner on his own behalf but this was not exactly the sort of payment which robin had expected to receive he thanked the knight therefore in set phrase but reminded him that a yeoman like himself might hardly offer such a dinner to a knight as a gift of charity i have no money master robin answered the knight frankly i have so little of the world's goods in sooth that i should be ashamed to offer you the whole of it money however little always jingles merrily in our pockets said robin smiling pray you tell me what you deem a little sum i have of my own ten silver pennies said the knight here they are and i wish they were ten times as many he handed little john his pouch and robin nodded carelessly what say you to the total little john he asked as though in jest tis true enough as the worthy knight hath said responded the big fellow gravely emptying the contents on his cloak robin signed to marion who filled a bumper of wine for himself and his guest pledge me sir knight cried the merry outlaw and pledge me heartily for these sorry times i see that your armour is bent and that your clothes are torn yet methinks i saw you at court once upon a day and in more prosperous guise tell me now were you a yeoman and made a knight by force or have you been a bad steward to yourself and wasted your property in lawsuits and the like be not bashful with us we shall not betray your secrets i am a saxon knight in my own right and i have always lived a sober and quiet life the sorrowful guest replied tis true you have seen me at court mayhap for i was an excited witness of your shooting before king harry god rest his bones my name is sir richard of the lea and i dwell in a castle not a league from one of the gates of nottingham which has belonged to my father and his father and his father's father before him within two or three years ago my neighbours might have told you that a matter of four hundred pounds one way or the other was as naught to me but now i have only these ten pennies of silver and my wife and son in what manner have you lost your riches asked robin through folly and kindness said the knight sighing i went with king richard upon a crusade from which i am but lately returned in time to find my son a goodly youth grown up he was but twenty yet he had achieved a squire's training and could play prettily in jousts and tournaments and other knightly games but about this time he had the ill luck to push his sport too far and did accidentally kill a knight in the open lists to save the boy i had to sell my lands and mortgage my ancestral castle and this not being enough in the end i have had to borrow money at a ruinous interest from my lord of hereford a most worthy bishop said robin ironically what is the sum of your debt four hundred pounds said sir richard and the bishop swears he will foreclose the mortgage if they are not paid promptly have you any friends who would become surety for you not one if good king richard were here the tale might be otherwise fill your goblet again sir knight said robin and he turned to whisper a word in marion's ear she nodded and drew little john and will scarlet aside and talked earnestly with them in a low tone here is health and prosperity to you gallant robin said sir richard tilting his goblet i hope i may pay your cheer more worthily the next time i ride by will scarlet and little john had meanwhile fallen in with marion's idea for they consulted the other outlaws who nodded their heads thereupon little john and will scarlet went into the cave near by 
and presently returned bearing a bag of gold. This they counted out before the astonished knight, and there were four times one hundred gold pieces in it. "'Take this loan from us, sir knight, and pay your debt to the bishop,' then said Robin. "'Nay, no thanks. You are but exchanging creditors. Mayhap we shall not be so hard upon you as the Christian bishop. Yet again we may be harder. Who can tell?' There were actual tears in Sir Richard's eyes, as he essayed to thank the foresters. But at this juncture, Much, the miller's son, came from the cave dragging a bale of cloth. "'The knight should have a suit worthy of his rank, master. Think you not so?' "'Measure him twenty ells of it,' ordered Robin. "'Give him a good horse also,' whispered Marian. "'Tis a gift which will come back fourfold, for this is a worthy man. I know him well.' So the horse was given also, and Robin bade Arthur a Bland ride with the knight as far as his castle, as esquire. The knight was sorrowful no longer, yet he could hardly voice his thanks through his broken utterance, and having spent the night in rest and listening to Allan a Dale's singing, he mounted his new steed the following morning, an altogether different man. "'God save you, comrades, and keep you all,' said he, with deep feeling in his tones, "'and God give me a grateful heart.' "'We shall wait for you twelve months from to-day here in this place,' said Robin, shaking him by the hand, "'and then you will repay us the loan, if you have been prospered. "'I shall return it to you within the year, upon my honour, as Sir Richard of the Lay, "'and for all time pray count on me as a steadfast friend.' "'So saying, the knight and his esquire rode down the forest glade till they were lost to view. "'So ends Chapter 16. Chapter 17 how the bishop was dined. Oh, what is the matter, then said the bishop, or for whom do you make this ado? Or why do you kill the king's venison when your company is so few? We are shepherds, quoth bold Robin Hood, and we keep sheep all the year, and we are disposed to be merry this day, and to kill of the king's fat deer. Not many days after Sir Richard of the Lea came to Sherwood Forest, Word reached Robin Hood's ears that my Lord Bishop of Hereford would be riding that way betimes on that morning. Twas Arthur Bland, the knight's quondam esquire, who brought the tidings, and Robin's face brightened as he heard it. Now, by Our Lady, quoth he, I have long desired to entertain my Lord in the greenwood, and this is too fair a chance to let slip. Come, my men, kill me a venison, kill me a good fat deer. The bishop of Hereford is to dine with me to-day, and he shall pay well for his cheer. "'Shall we dress it here as usual?' asked Much, the miller's son. "'Nay, we play a droll game on the churchman. We will dress it by the highway side, and watch for the bishop narrowly, lest he should ride some other way.' So Robin gave his orders, and the main body of his men dispersed to different parts of the forest, under Will Stutley and Little John, to watch other roads, while Robin Hood himself took six of his men, including Will Scarlet and Much, and posted himself in full view of the main road. This little company appeared funny enough, I assure you, for they had disguised themselves as shepherds. Robin had an old wool cap with a tail to it hanging over his ear, and a shock of hair stood straight up through a hole in the top. Besides, there was so much dirt on his face that you would never have known him. An old tattered cloak over his hunter's garb completed his make-up. The others were no less ragged and unkempt, even the foppish Will Scarlet being so badly run down at the heel that the court ladies would hardly have had speech with him. They quickly provided themselves with a deer and made great preparations to cook it over a small fire, when a little dust was seen blowing along the highway, and out of it came the portly bishop, cantering along with ten men at arms at his heels. As soon as he saw the fancied shepherds, he spurred up his horse and came straight toward them. "'Who are ye fellows who make so free with the king's deer?' he asked sharply. "'We are shepherds,' answered Robin Hood, pulling at his forelock awkwardly. "'Heaven have mercy! Ye seem a sorry lot of shepherds. But who gave you leave to cease eating mutton?' "'Tis one of our feast days, lording, and we were disposed to be merry this day, and make free with a deer, out here where there are so many. By me faith, the king shall hear of this. Who killed yon beast? Give me first your name, excellence, so that I may speak where tis fitting, replied Robin stubbornly. Tis my lord bishop of Hereford, fellow, 
interposed one of the guards fiercely. See that you keep a civil tongue in your head. If tis a churchman, retorted Will Scarlet, he would do better to mind his own flocks rather than concern himself with ours. Ye are saucy fellows in sooth, cried the bishop, and we will see if your heads will pay for your manners. Come, quit your stolen roast and march along with me, for you shall be brought before the sheriff of Nottingham forthwith. Pardon, Excellence, said Robin, dropping on his knees. Pardon, I pray you. It becomes not your lordship's coat to take so many lives away. Faith, I'll pardon you, said the bishop. I'll pardon you when I see you hanged. Seize upon them, my men. But Robin had already sprung away with his back against a tree, and from underneath his ragged cloak he drew his trusty horn and winded the piercing notes which were wont to summon the band. The bishop no sooner saw this action than he knew his man, and that there was a trap set, and being an errant coward, he wheeled his horse sharply and would have made off down the road, but his own men, spurred on the charge, blocked his way. At almost the same instant the bushes round about seemed literally to come alive with outlaws. Little John's men came from one side and Will Stutley's from the other. In less time than it takes to tell it, the worthy bishop found himself a prisoner, and began to crave mercy from the men he had so lately been ready to sentence. "'O oh, pardon, O oh, pardon,' said the bishop, "'O oh, pardon, I you pray. For if I had known it had been you, I'd have gone some other way.' "'I owe you no pardon,' retorted Robin, "'but I will even treat you better than you would have treated me. Come, make haste, and go along with me. I have already planned that you shall dine with me this day.' So the unwilling prelate was dragged away, cheek by jowl, with the half-cooked venison upon the back of his own horse, and Robin and his band took charge of the whole company, and led them through the forest glades till they came to an open space near Barnsdale. Here they rested, and Robin gave the bishop a seat full courteously. Much the miller's son fell to roasting the deer afresh, while another and fatter beast was set to frizzle on the other side of the fire. Presently the appetizing odor of the cooking reached the bishop's nostrils, and he sniffed it eagerly. The morning's ride had made him hungry, and he was nothing loath when they bade him come to the dinner. Robin gave him the best place beside himself, and the bishop prepared to fall to. "'Nay, my lord, craving your pardon, but we are accustomed to have grace before meat,' said Robin decorously. "'And as our own chaplain is not with us to-day, will you be good enough to say it for us?' The bishop reddened, but pronounced grace in the Latin tongue hastily, and then settled himself to make the best of his lot. Red wines and ale were brought forth and poured out, each man having a horn tankard from which to drink. Laughter bubbled among the diners, and the bishop caught himself smiling at more than one jest. But who, in sooth, could resist a freshly broiled venison steak eaten out in the open air to the tune of jest and good fellowship? Stutley filled the bishop's beaker with wine each time he emptied it, and the bishop got mellower and mellower as the afternoon shades lengthened on towards sunset. Then the approaching dusk warned him of his position. "'I wish, mine host,' quoth he gravely to Robin, who had soberly drunk but one cup of ale, "'that you would now call a reckoning. Tis late, and I fear the cost of this entertainment may be more than my poor purse can stand.' For he bethought himself of his friend, the sheriff's former experience. "'Verily, your lordship,' said Robin, scratching his head, "'I have enjoyed your company so much that I scarce know how to charge for it.' "'Lend me your purse, my lord,' said Little John, interposing, "'and I'll give you the reckoning by and by.' The bishop shuddered. He had collected Sir Richard's debt only that morning, and was even then carrying it home. "'I have but a few silver pennies of my own,' he whined, "'and as for the gold in my saddlebags, tis for the church. Ye surely would not levy upon the church, good friends.' But Little John was already gone to the saddlebags, and returning he laid the bishop's cloak upon the ground, and poured out of the portmantua a matter of four hundred glittering gold pieces. T'was the identical money which Robin had lent Sir Richard a short while before. Ah, said Robin, as though an idea had but just then come to him, the church is always willing to aid in charity, and seeing this goodly sum reminds me that I have a friend who is indebted to a churchman for this exact amount. Now we shall charge you nothing by our own account, but suffer us to make use of this in aiding my good friend. Nay, nay, began the bishop with a wry face. This is requiting me ill indeed. 
was this not the king's meat after all that we feasted upon furthermore i am a poor man poor forsooth answered robin in scorn you are the bishop of hereford and does not the whole countryside speak of your oppression who does not know of your cruelty to the poor and ignorant you who should use your great office to aid them instead of oppress have you not been guilty of far greater robbery than this even though less open of myself and how you have pursued me i say nothing nor of your unjust enmity against my father but on account of those you have despoiled and oppressed i take this money and will use it far more worthily than you would god be my witness in this there is an end of the matter unless you will lead us in a song or dance to show that your body had a better spirit than your mind come strike up the harp alan neither the one nor the other will i do snarled the bishop faith then we must help you said little john and he and arthur a bland seized the fat struggling churchman and commenced to hop up and down the bishop being shorter must perforce accompany them in their gyrations while the whole company sat and rolled about over the ground and roared to see my lord of hereford's queer capers at last he sank in a heap fuddled with wine and quite exhausted little john picked him up as though he were a log of wood and carrying him to his horse set him astride facing the animal's tail and thus fastened him leading the animal toward the high road and starting the bishop more dead than alive toward nottingham so ends chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of robin hood how the bishop went outlaw hunting then the bishop he came to the old woman's house and called with furious mood come let me soon see and bring unto me that traitor robin hood the easy success with which they had got the better of the good bishop led robin to be a little careless he thought that his guest was too great a coward to venture back into the greenwood for many a long day and so after laying quiet for one day the outlaw ventured boldly upon the highway the morning of the second but he had gone only half a mile when turning a sharp bend in the road he plunged full upon the prelate himself my lord of hereford had been so deeply smitten in his pride that he had lost no time in summoning a considerable body of the sheriff's men offering to double the reward if robin hood could be come upon this company was now at his heels and after the first shock of mutual surprise the bishop gave an exultant shout and spurred upon the outlaw it was too late for robin to retreat by the way he had come but quick as a flash he sprang to one side of the road dodged under some bushes and disappeared so suddenly that his pursuers thought he had truly been swallowed up by magic after him yelled the bishop some of you beat up the woods around him while the rest of us will keep on the main road and head him off on the other side for truth to tell the bishop did not care to trust his bones away from the high road about a mile away on the other side of this neck of woods wherein robin had been trapped was a little tumble-down cottage twas where the widow lived whose three sons had been rescued robin remembered the cottage and saw his one chance to escape doubling in and out among the underbrush and heather with the agility of a hare he soon came out of the wood in the rear of the cottage and thrust his head through a tiny window the widow who had been at her spinning wheel rose up with a cry of alarm quiet good mother tis i robin hood where are your three sons they should be with you robin well do you know that do they not owe their lives to you if that be so i come to seek payment of the debt said robin in a breath the bishop is on my heels with many of his men i'll cheat the bishop and all cried the woman quickly here robin change your raiment with me and we will see if my lord knows an old woman when he sees her good said robin pass your gray cloak out the window and also your spindle and twine and i will give you my green mantle and everything else down to my bow and arrows while they were talking robin had been nimbly changing clothes with the old woman through the window and in a jiffy he stood forthwith complete even to the spindle and twine presently up dashed the bishop with his men and at sight of the cottage and the old woman gave pause the crone was hobbling along with difficulty leaning heavily upon a gnarled stick and bearing the spindle on her other arm she would have gone by the bishop's company while muttering to herself but the bishop ordered one of his men to question her the soldier laid his hand upon her shoulder mind your business croaked the woman or i'll curse ye 
"'Come, come, my good woman,' said the soldier, who really was afraid of her curses. "'I'll not molest you. But my Lord Bishop of Hereford wants to know if you have seen aught of the outlaw, Robin Hood.' "'And why shouldn't I see him?' she whined. "'Where's the king or law to prevent good Robin from coming to see me and bring me food and raiment? That's more than my Lord Bishop will do, I warrant ye.' "'Peace, woman,' said the bishop harshly. "'We want none of your opinions.' but we'll take you to Barnsdale and burn you for a witch if you do not instantly tell us when you last saw Robin Hood. Mercy, good my lord, chattered the crone, falling on her knees. Robin is there in my cottage now, but you'll never take him alive. We'll see about that, cried the bishop triumphantly. Enter the cottage, my men, fire it if need be, but I'll give a purse of gold pieces above the reward to the man who captures the outlaw alive. The old woman, being released, went on her way slowly, but it might have been noticed that the farther she got away from the company and the nearer to the edge of the woods, the swifter and straighter grew her pace. Once inside the shelter of the forest, she broke into a run of surprising swiftness. "'Gadzooks!' exclaimed Little John, who presently spied her. "'Who comes here? Never saw I witch or woman run so fast. Methinks I'll send an arrow close over her head to see which it is.' "'Oh, hold your hand, hold your hand!' panted the supposed woman. "'Tis I, Robin Hood. Summon the yeoman and return with me speedily. We have still another score to settle with my lord of Hereford.' When Little John could catch his breath from laughing, he winded his horn. "'Now, Mistress Robin,' quoth he, grinning, "'lead on. We'll be close to your heels.' Meanwhile, back at the widow's cottage, the bishop was growing more furious every moment. For all his bold words he dared not fire the house and the sturdy door had thus far resisted all his men's efforts. "'Break it down! Break it down!' he shouted, "'and let me soon see who will fetch out that traitor, Robin Hood!' At last the door crashed in, and the men stood guard on the threshold, but not one dared enter for fear a sharp arrow should meet him halfway. "'Here he is!' cried one keen-eyed fellow, peering in. "'I see him in the corner by the cupboard. Shall we slay him with our pikes?' "'Nay!' said the bishop. Take him alive if you can. We'll make the biggest public hanging of this that the Shire ever beheld. But the joy of the bishop over his capture was short-lived. Down the road came striding the shabby figure of the old woman who had helped him set the trap, and very wrathy was she when she saw that the cottage door had been battered in. Stand by, you lazy rascals, she called to the soldiers. May all the devils catch ye for hurting an old woman's hut. Stand by, I say. Hold your tongue ordered the bishop. These are my men and carrying out my orders. God mercy, swore the beldame harshly. Things have come to a pretty pass when our homes may be treated like common goals. Couldn't all your men catch one poor forester without this ado? Come, clear out, you and your robber, on the instant, or I'll curse every mother's son of ye, eating and drinking and sleeping. Seize on the hag! shouted the bishop, as soon as he could get in a word. We'll see about a witch's cursing. Back to town she shall go, alongside of Robin Hood. Not so fast, your worship, she retorted, clapping her hands. And at the signal, a goodly array of greenwood men sprang forth from all sides of the cottage, with bows drawn back threateningly. The bishop saw that his men were trapped again, for they dared not stir. Natheless, he determined to make a fight for it. "'If one of you but budge an inch toward me, you rascals,' he cried, "'it shall sound the death of your master Robin Hood. "'My men have him here under their pikes, "'and I shall command them to kill him without mercy.' "'Faith, I should like to see the Robin you have caught,' "'said a clear voice from under the widow's cape, "'and the outlaw chief stood forth with bared head, smilingly. "'Here am I, my lord, in no wise imperiled by your men's fierce pikes.' so let us see whom you have been guarding so well. The old woman who, in the garb of Robin Hood, had been lying quiet in the cottage through all the uproar, jumped up nimbly at this. In the bald absurdity of her disguise she came to the doorway and bowed to the bishop. "'Give you good den, my lord bishop,' she piped in a shrill voice. "'And what does your grace at my humble door? Do you come to bless me and give me alms?' "'Aye, that does he,' answered Robin. We shall see if his saddlebags contain enough to pay you for that battered door. Now, by all the saints, began the bishop. Take care, they are all watching you, interrupted Robin. 
so name them not upon your unchurchly lips. But I will trouble you to hand over that purse of gold you had saved to pay for my head. I'll see you hanged first, raged the bishop, stating no more than what would have been so if he could do the ordering of things. Have at them, my men, and hew them down in their tracks. Hold, retorted Robin. See how we have you at our mercy. And aiming a sudden shaft, he shot so close to the bishop's head that it carried away both his hat and the skull-cap which he always wore, leaving him quite bald. The prelate turned as white as his shiny head and clutched wildly at his ears. He thought himself dead almost. Help! Murder! he gasped. Do not shoot again! Here's your purse of gold! And without waiting for further parley, he fairly bolted down the road. His men being left leaderless had nothing for it but to retreat after him which they did in sullen order, covered by the bows of the yeomen. And thus ended the Bishop of Hereford's great outlaw hunt in the forest. So ends chapter 18.